I would like to address some of my observations to the questionnaire, which I believe delegates will have see, had sight of, which is Euclid's um, uh, sortie into gathering um, a, a direction of travel in order to advise um, uh, Europe in, in the way in which it might wish to take this initiative forward. So, and I think there's some very interesting questions, um, and as I read through them, I also had some observations. Um, for me, the fact that Europe um, has taken the bull by the horns and has decided that it does want to encourage the development of a social economy um, and recognises that there is such a thing as the social economy um, and that uh, government uh, support or, 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 or um, bilateral government support is very much there to address market failure is, is very timely <coughs> because um, through the cutting of uh, government money, we, we could regress to a stage where people take a very unimaginative approach and just feel that what we're doing is stepping out of the market and sort of you know, anti-government governments could, could be emerging. So mm -hmm. it is an important moment for Europe to take some leadership and decide that actually in, in lieu of, of, of what are quite swinging cuts in a number of countries, um, that, that you can offer a vision of targeting where market failure has occurred and where the social economy actually has a very real role to play. Um, the biggest social problem that we've got at the moment, and there are so many, but clearly the critical social problem um, is the unemployment of the young, reaching over 50% in countries like Spain, but um, particularly in this country, you know, we also have um, an unprecedented number of young people who are without work and without the hope of work. This is unsustainable on every conceivable level. Um, I've been in this industry long enough to know that I used to work with a long-term unemployed 20 years ago. Um, most of those people were generationally unemployed as a result of um, cutbacks that occurred the last time um, the government tried to uh, live without a, a, an underclass of people who, who they felt could, could be cut, cut, cut adrift. Um, the, the cost of that systemically over generations is unsustainable. Lessons that need to be learned, and again, this is reflected in the questionnaire. We, one of the things we've learned in the UK, undoubtedly, is that um, growth follows investment. Um, you know, the halcyon days may have passed, but undoubtedly, the money that the previous government put into infrastructure, um, uh, uh, experimentation, and investment um, opportunities, um, in information sharing. Um, has paid dividends. It's why we have a purported 66,000 number of social enterprises. But more especially, because some of our numbers can, can be um, you know, compared with other European countries, but I think what's unique about the uh, English, um, the, the, the UK experience, forgive me, is the uh, multiplicity of it, the way in which social enterprises pretty much popped over, up all over. You know, it is extraordinarily diverse. It doesn't just, for instance, administer the lot national lottery. It doesn't just work, for instance, in just in social care. It is absolutely all over the show. Um, a friend of mine, Glenn Staunton, often says the only place it doesn't pop up is in armaments. So, you know, um, and I think that's <coughs> probably true. Um, you know, and, and it's that diversity, it's that that that, that extraordinary uh, creativity that, that that's happened over the years, and, and we need to celebrate that um, and recognise that despite the fact we have spent a great deal of time talking about models and what social enterprise is, um, we, we have actually fostered an extraordinary breadth of experience. There was uh, a degree of emphasis on legal structures within the questionnaire and um, my, my, my cautionary note on that is that legal structures for instance, the community interest company, are extremely supportive, and we now have over 6,000 community interest companies in this country. And creating the community interest company was not without its difficulties. It's the first um, new form of company legal structure that we've had in the UK for the last 400 years. So it was quite an innovation. Um, and, and it's a good space in which for like-minded companies to provide co-support. But... When I look, for instance, through my work at the Transition Institute, which is a platform for independent public service providers that um, seek to maximise social value, a bit of a mouthful, but basically <coughs> folk who deliver public services independently who do so very explicitly to improve <coughs> social value and not for shareholder profit. 
So that is, that's a, a combination of people who've come from the voluntary sector, cooperatives, mutuals, employee owned, and what we now call hybrid, which are organisations that are to some degree employee run, but have to leverage um, capital, um, so have sort of interesting and, and varied uh, ownership models. All of these things are brought together, but what, what unites us in, in, that, in that platform is the interest in social value. So rather than putting a great deal of emphasis on legal structures, although nice legal structures that are very clear in the way they support social enterprise are super, and community interest companies are great, really, if you wanted to pick up where we left off without spending 10 years going round and round the cul-de-sac, you could just focus on social value and what that means. And really what we want to see, I think, is a, is a rating service, a sort of Moody's of social value that is offered up to uh, particularly public sector procurement, but right the way across the piece, because you could have a form of, of, of ratings on social value that, for instance, could be quite an interesting way in which you could leverage capital on the high street. The other emphasis, I would say, is that we have done an awful lot of work in putting in specialist investment vehicles, and I think the big society capital is fantastic. But I do come back to this point, which is a lot of the money that we have seen enter the market, it's still quite difficult to get hold of, mm -hmm. and it's still expensive. And if you're already running a social venture, which is already investing a lot of its margin in social impact, the fact that you have to spend more to borrow the money yeah. because the only people who are lending to you are specialist vehicles is, is almost, it's not quite, but it's almost setting people up to fail. Again, if you were starting from where we've left off in Europe, what we really have to do is get the mainstream to invest and understand. So again, it brings me back to this notion of social value. So what would a European network do? I think it would consolidate a lot of learning, it would exchange best practice, and these aren't just words. I think it would collect data. It's really interesting sitting here in the, in the middle of what is the maelstrom of economic um, austerity, with everybody running around like chickens with their heads cut off, saying there's no time to do anything. I have been in social enterprise now for too long, but about 10 years. And people have been saying that for 10 years. So even at the height of investment, nobody had any time to collect any data. Um, and we've suffered by that. We really have. We've been hamstrung. So, you know, the 66,000 really is between you and I and these four walls, pin the tail on the donkey. You know, nobody really knows. And nobody's ever stopped to invest. Even at the height of government investment, nobody ever stopped. Data collection, understanding the true nature of the interventions that we've met and the, and the, and the market in which... We, that we represent is absolutely vital and, and um, something that I think a European network needs to do. And it can start from a, a level playing field of, of taking an open view about what social, the social economy is. Um, and, and I think it needs to emphasise really the difference that it makes rather than the way in which it's financed. So those would be my primary observations. I love the discussion earlier about procurement and commissioning. I think this is um, I, I did a briefing for Gareth Thompson, Thomas recently, and I think this is our Waterloo. I think unless we can get this right, um, so many, uh, so many um, possible ventures, exciting, life-changing, community-enhancing ventures will go to the wall, um, and that's simply not acceptable for the want of a good scrap. So, you know, from my point of view, the Transition Institute is very much on the front line of arguing the case that really government has to wake up and smell the coffee. It talks about a lot about what it wants to do. I applaud those observations, but it was simply, <coughs> if it doesn't go shopping for the right thing, it won't come home with what it wanted. Um, and so it has to set out very clearly, if it wants to buy into the social economy, it's got to go shopping in the right marketplace, it's got to set the terms of engagement to enable this level playing field that we talk about. So looking forward to working in partnership, very much welcome the European network and um, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.